think we're all very excited to hear Alan's talk. So Alan, why don't you take it away? Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to my talk about long-tailed distributions. I'm Alan Downey. I'm a producer at Brilliant, which means that I write online courses. And I was, for a long time, a professor at Olin College. I am also working on a book called Probably Overthinking It. What I'm talking about today is chapter eight from this book. It is about long tail distributions, and my claim is that these are common in natural and engineered systems. They violate our intuition, they defy prediction, and they leave us unprepared for disaster. And let me explain what I mean. I'm gonna start with a small data set which is a list of natural and human-made disasters from Wikipedia. And I'm going to look at the distribution of the total cost of that disaster. And if we plot on the x-axis here the cost in billions of inflation-adjusted dollars, on the y-axis, this is the tail distribution. That means the percentage of these disasters that exceed a given threshold cost. And what we can see on a linear, linear scale is that most of these disasters are smaller, cost less than $100 billion, but a few of them extend out into a long tail. If we look at this on a linear scale, all of the data is mashed up against the axes, which is always your warning that you are not visualizing something well. So the first step is to put the x-axis onto a log scale. So this is the logarithms of the costs in billions of dollars. And now the distribution moves through the middle of this figure, which means that we're visualizing it well. And it has this characteristic shape, the sigmoid, which resembles a Gaussian distribution. So a Gaussian on a log scale is a log normal distribution. What this suggests is that that might be a good model for this data. So I'm gonna put up a picture this is the same data again, but the gray line here is showing a log normal model that fits the data, and it looks pretty good. If you plotted this, you would say the model fits the data well. There's a gray area there that doesn't come out well on the projector that shows the range of variability that we expect due to chance. And if you can squint and see that, the data fall almost entirely within that range. So this model looks good. Maybe there are a few more disasters near 100 billion, but it's within the amount of variability that we expect by chance. And then a black swan comes along and suggests, what if we look at this on a y, uh, with the y-axis on a log scale? And to demonstrate this, I'm gonna show you a fake lesson that I made using the brilliant site. So this is not something that we've published. We don't have a class about long tail distributions quite yet. But when we do, one of the things that it might show is that when we look at this distribution on a linear y-axis, most of the information is on the left part of the curve. The left third of this distribution is taking up about half of my vertical space. And the tail, the rightmost third of this distribution, is only getting about a tenth of the visible space. And again, the information that I want is mashed up against the axis, which means that I can't see it clearly. If I go to a log scale, it compresses the left-hand side, so now it's only getting about a tenth of my vertical space, and my tail has expanded substantially. The rightmost third now is taking up about half of my available visual information. Just to give you a sense, of how that transformation is causing this to happen. I'm gonna show you what happens as we slide smoothly between a linear and logarithmic transformation. So here on a linear scale, the left side is big and the right side is small. And as I move smoothly from a linear to a log scale, you can see that right-hand side being nice and, and stretched out. So I like this visualization because it lets us see the expansion and contraction of the two parts. However, if you're of a mathematical bent and you're asking yourself, what does this mean in between when we're halfway between <laughs> a linear and a log scale, you realize that from a mathematical point of view, this makes no sense whatsoever. But 
it is showing you how that tail gets stretched. So if somebody asks you which of these scales is best for visualizing the tail behavior, you would say, I, I think the log distribution is the way to go. All right, so if we put this onto a y-axis log scale, it is like a microscope for zooming in on that extreme right-hand part of the distribution. And now if we go back to this visualization, again, linear scale looks okay, seems pretty good. Put it on this log y scale, and now we can see that there's a serious discrepancy at the extremes. The log normal model is dropping off much more steeply than the data, and there's a substantial gap on the right-hand side, which means that the model is underestimating the probability of these rare events. When we're talking about preparing for disasters, that is a bad thing, because your model is telling you that a disaster that exceeds $500 billion should happen only one time in 1,000, but in reality, it is 16 times out of 1,000. A factor of 16 is pretty bad. We're going to see that it's going to get worse. So the model underestimates the probability of large, rare disasters. We're going to need a better model. There are a few long-tailed models to choose from. I'm not going to get deep into this, but I will point you to this paper. And if you download the slides, there's a link on the right-hand side there where you can get the slides. And from there, links to everything else that I'm going to talk about. This paper is a good survey of the history and the different models that we can use for this kind of data. The particular one that I'm going to use is student's T distribution. This is William Gossett, who wrote about this distribution using the pseudonym student because he was working doing quality assurance at the Guinness factory at the time. But this is similar to a Gaussian distribution, except that it has a longer tail. So it is described by three parameters, location and scale, like a Gaussian, plus an additional parameter, which is degrees of freedom, represented by nu, uh, that controls the thickness of the tail. So taking advantage of this nice figure from Wikipedia, we can see how the shape of the distribution varies as we change nu. When nu equals one, that is like the super long-tailed behavior. That is the orange curve in this figure with the very thick tails going out to the extremes. At the other end, as nu goes to infinity, this converges to a Gaussian distribution. So with very large nu, it's basically just a Gaussian. The middle, the range of about 3 to 10, is what you tend to see in data sets in the real world. So that's the space that we're going to explore. This is an example. This is a standard normal distribution plotted against a student T distribution with the parameter 10, you know, new or degrees of freedom equal to 10. And you can see on a linear scale, they don't look super different. And you could fool yourself into thinking that the Gaussian model was good enough. But one more time, when you put that y-axis on a log scale, the discrepancy in the extreme of the tail becomes really apparent. In this example, it's a couple of orders of magnitude of difference. Turns out, if we estimate the parameters to fit that distribution that I was showing you a minute ago, nu equals 3.5 fits the data pretty well. So this, I'm now going to show you some figures with the linear scale on top and the log scale on the bottom, the same x-axis. And this is useful because in the top figure, we can see most clearly the middle part of the curve, which you can think of as normal cases. And in the lower figure with the log transform, we can see the tail more clearly. Those are the extreme values. So both of them fit pretty well. The log T model is doing a pretty good job for the normal part of the curve and a pretty good job for the tail part of the curve. Just to reiterate, because we're going to see that figure over and over, the top is on a linear scale, the bottom is on the log scale. One other thing, I'm fitting this, the T distribution, to the logarithms. So in the same way that if your logarithms fit a normal distribution, that means that the values are log normal. 
if your logarithms fit a t distribution, I'm going to call that the log t distribution. As far as I know, this name doesn't exist. That's just what I'm calling it. All right. I claim that this is common in natural and engineered systems. Let me start to look at some examples. Earthquakes. Data from the Southern California Earthquake Data Center. I have to say thank you to the people from the USGS that I had breakfast with this morning. This is their data. They have almost a million earthquakes going back to 1981 in this region of Southern California. And this is the distribution of those magnitudes. Now, the magnitude scale that we use for earthquakes is already sort of logarithmic. It's the logarithm of energy, so no transform on the x-axis required. Again, I've got linear on top, log y-axis on the bottom, and we see again that the log normal model is dropping off much more steeply than the data. It's underestimating the probability of rare events. If you only looked at the top figure, you might think that this model was OK. When you look at that bottom figure, you see that gap. And numerically, it's pretty bad. If you predict the fraction of earthquakes with magnitude of four or more, the model says 33 per million. The data says 1,800 per million. You're off by a factor of 55. Wow, that's bad. Wait, it's worse. Things we really care about are large earthquakes, things like magnitude 7. If you ask the model, it would say, oh, OK, that's going to happen five times out of 10 to the 18th. Effectively, never. The data is saying that that's going to happen six times per million, which is 12 orders of magnitude more likely. And in fact, a magnitude 7 earthquake is not a super, super rare event. We have had one in California as recently as 2019. So the model says that this should never happen. Recent memory says it just happened. So that is how bad that is. This is an example of what Nicholas Taleb calls, uh, Nassim Taleb calls a black swan. The definition that he gives is that this is a large, impactful event. It's considered extremely unlikely based on a model of prior events. And I want to emphasize the model in this definition, because it's limited by both the data and the model that you choose. So in the case of the earthquake data, the log normal model is a bad choice. And we want to see whether the log t distribution does better. Now, I'm using an extra parameter, so we expect it to fit the data better. But it fits the data pretty remarkably well. This is the kind of fit where when you're experimenting and you find something like this, you think that you might be on to something. And I'll get back to why the distribution might work, might have this shape. But this is suggesting that we have a pretty good model here for the tail of the distribution of earthquakes, which means that we might have tamed this black swan. And again, this is uh, Taleb's idea that if you have enough data and you use an appropriate model, you can make good predictions. And in that case, you've taken a black swan and tamed it, and he terms that to be a gray swan. So that's the good news. There's bad news coming, but that's, that's the good news. I want to propose this black swan hypothesis in two forms. There is a weak form that says that if you choose a bad model, your predictions will be bad. This is entirely unsurprising. That part's not really that big a deal. In fact, I'm going to put it into meme form. If your model is bad, your predictions will be bad. I think no argument there. The strong form of the black swan hypothesis is, I think, more interesting. And it's the claim that some black swans cannot be tamed, or maybe you just can't know whether you have tamed them or not. I'm going to give an example, which is solar flares. I think these are a good candidate for untamable black swans. I'm going to use data from the Space Weather Prediction Center. This is from the GOES satellite network, which has been observing our sun and monitoring solar flares. Since about 1997, we have tens of thousands of solar flares that we have observed, and we have the energy that they would radiate per square meter. This is what those distributions look like 
compared to a log normal model. One more time, if you looked at that top figure, you might think that this model was good enough. When you look at the bottom figure on a log y scale, there's a big gap there where the model underestimates the probability of large events. If your model is bad, your predictions will be bad. The log t model, substantially better. In terms of a curve fit, pretty good. In terms of a visual evaluation, you might look at that and say, your data has some curvature there that seems like a pretty consistent pattern that your model is not capturing, which is one reason that you might want to be nervous about this model. So let's see what we could do with this model. We want to make predictions. Particularly, we might be worried about super flares. This is something we have seen from other stars. Flares that are 10,000 times bigger than anything we have seen our sun produce. It would be very bad if our sun produced a solar flare. So this is something of some urgency to know whether our sun can produce a super flare. The question is, can we use the model that we have so far to answer that? Here's what it looks like to extrapolate from the data that we have out four more orders of magnitude to make this prediction. We might ask, how much confidence would we have in the prediction coming out of that model? And the black swan suggests not much for a couple of reasons. One, we have, even though there are tens of thousands of observations, that is a relatively small sample for what we're trying to do. We see a hint that this model might, might not be quite the right shape because of that curvature, and we are extrapolating four orders of magnitude beyond the data. These are all reasons to think that to tame this one, we need more data and we need more astrophysics. So far in 20 years, we've seen 36,000 flares. If we observed for 500 more years, we would be up to a million observations, and that would still be two orders of magnitude less than we would need to make a confident prediction about this extreme tail. And we don't have the astrophysics to know whether it's just a different kind of star that produces super flares, and our sun will never do that, or whether we just haven't seen one yet. So this is a limit of how far you can get with a purely statistical model without some physics behind it. It would help to have some ideas about where these distributions come from. Why do things follow long tail distributions? There are a few mechanisms that people have proposed. One of them is preferential attachment, which is phenomena where the rich get richer. And this is sometimes called the Matthew effect. It has a few other names because it has been independently discovered in every field of natural and social science. But in general, when you have these aggregating processes where the rich get richer, you see long tail distributions. There are also models based on self-organized criticality that produce these long tailed distributions. And that's been proposed in particular as a possible explanation for earthquakes. The other piece of this, in particular for student t distributions, where they come from mathematically is they are a mixture of, log, of, of normal distributions with different variants, or if you like on a log scale, a mixture of log normals. So we could look for physical phenomena that are generating lots of log normals with different variants and aggregating. There's one other explanation for this that comes from Mandelbrot's book, The Fractal Geometry of Nature. What, what he suggests is that the data that we observe that have this long tail, they are the joint effect of a fixed underlying true distribution and a highly variable filter that leaves the asymptotic behavior unchanged. That was his language. I'm gonna decode that by showing you a particular example, which is lunar craters. One more data set, the Robbins data set of moon craters contains, I forget how many, a large number of uh, craters that are uh, one kilometer or larger 
in diameter. I'm going to skip over the log normal distribution and take you straight to the log t. It fits these OK. Again, we're seeing some departures there that say, maybe this isn't everything that's going on. Um, but nature is not obligated to follow simple mathematical models. Nevertheless, this seems like a reasonable description of the distribution of craters. Why should they have that shape? One way to think about it is these craters got formed by the late heavy bombardment, which were asteroids that were displaced from the main asteroid belt and hit the moon. What does the distribution of asteroid sizes look like? NASA can help us with this. They have the small body database. They have more than 100 asteroids with known diameters. And compared to a log T model, this is what the distribution of asteroids looks like. Again, clearly things in the world that are not in our model, but as a three parameter model, it's doing OK. Now, let's look at the relationship between the size of a crater, sorry, the size of an asteroid and the size of the crater that it makes. It depends on its size, velocity, density, angle of impact, a couple of other factors. So we can simulate that. So I'm going to choose a random asteroid from the asteroid belt, throw it at the moon, and generate random parameters from these other uh, factors for these other um, uh, parts of that equation that we were just looking at. And if we compare the result of the simulation with the actual distribution of crater sizes, they look pretty good. Now, I've got some free parameters there in my simulations, so this isn't too surprising, but this does suggest that if the distribution of asteroids is long-tailed, then the distribution of craters will be long-tailed. So this is an example of the mechanism that Mandelbrot proposed, which is that maybe the craters are long-tailed because the asteroids are long-tailed, and maybe the asteroids are long-tailed because one of these rich-get-richer processes like accretion, where a large asteroid is more likely to collide with another particle and stick to it. So in Mandelbrot's vocabulary, the underlying process is accretion, and the highly variable filter is the uh, formation of these craters. All right, let me wrap this up. I claim long tail distributions appear in many fields. A bad model can seem OK if you look at it on a linear scale, but if you look at it on a log log scale, which is this microscope for the extreme values, you can see the discrepancies. If you use a good model, you can sometimes tame these black swans, but it may be practically impossible or maybe theoretically impossible to tame them all. Before we go, I'm going to suggest some sources and further reading, starting with my book, Probably Overthinking It. <laughs> this is chapter eight. This is coming out in the fall and just happens to be available for pre-order now. The other book I mentioned, of course, is uh, Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan. And if th so that book is written for a general audience. If you would like more technical details on this, there's a paper on archive that's quite good. It is extensive and detailed, but a lot of good information there. And uh, Mendelbrot's book, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, is the other one that I mentioned. And there are five different ways to get in touch with me if you want to follow up. But we are, uh, I think, have a little bit of time to take some questions. Thank you so much for the very engaging talk. Um, for those of you that have any questions in person, please raise your hand. Um, and if we have any remote questions, I will read them out loud. Right now we don't, so. I'll just mention that I have a, an example that I cut. So one question you could ask me is, Alan, is there a really ex interesting example that you cut? <laughs> but, but go ahead. Please. I like that you've seeded that question for somebody. I'll, I'll that's, a, the, that's a great question, but I've actually got a different one. So um, in all the examples you showed, you're using models that have support negative infinity to infinity, but all your data sets are support zero to infinity. Could you talk about that a little bit? 
yes, okay, so the data set are all positive values because I'm measuring something in the world. The models, uh, some of them extend to negative infinity. Um, the, once we're on a log x scale, we're okay, because that now goes to negative infinity as well. So, and I think after my first example, everything was on a log x scale, so that, that solves my, my domain problem. We have a question up here. Um, I have a question. Why not um, long necked swans? <laughs> Why is it long, <laughs> long tailed and not long necked? Yeah. The vocabulary here is weird. There's, there's, they're long tailed, fat tailed, heavy tailed, and they all sometimes mean the same thing. People have tried to give them more specific definitions, but it, it hasn't stuck. I guess so. heavy necked would be weird. That would be weird. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the uh, great talk as always. Um, so in the, the models that you were showing here, uh, it, obviously for this talk you chose very simple pedagogical ones, but then you know, even at the end you were showing that, okay, we can use simulation to try and get at these, uh, but still a pretty, uh, using ac actual information, actual physics, but uh, not all of it. So I guess in your, can you give a bit of insight into for these uh, these black swans that might be untamable, at what point do you th uh, you know should we as analysts be thinking about w how much more physics, how much more science do I am I lacking that I need to go work with other experts on to try and pull in versus at what point am I kind of tapped out and should I just more be considering the question, am I able to make meaningful predictions with my models? Period, or do have am I beat in some sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I'm thinking about different ways that you could extend these models to make them more physical. One is if you have a physical law that puts an upper bound on things, like if we knew that our sun could not produce solar flares, you could add a filter that trims the extreme tail. Some of the ones that I showed where there were some bumps, those are naturally modeled using mixtures. So if you had a reason to think that different asteroids formed at different times through different processes, that might explain a mixture. Or if you had reason to think that the sampling process was not random, like the asteroids that were displaced during this event might not have been a random sample of all of the asteroids, and you could model that sampling process, that would be another filter. That would make your models more realistic and it would also demonstrate Mandelbrot's point, which is that none of those filters change the, the qualitative asymptotic behavior. It's still this long tail shape. Thank you. So when you were showing the, the first example with the earthquakes, um, it looked like using the log normal distribution, that model was under sampling the tails. And then some of your later examples, it looks like your models were, uh, had thicker tails than the data suggested. So do you have anything you can say about that with regards to these black swan uh, scenarios? Because if you're trying to make sure you're accounting for these rare, highly impactful events or things, well, if your model over predicts them, is that better than under predicting them? Right, yes, so your observation is right. The log normal model compared to a long tail distribution is always going to under predict. The student T model is pretty flexible. It can have on that log scale positive or negative curvature and in some of the examples as you said, it's overshooting the data and predicting a really probably unrealistic long tail. Is that a feature or a bug? I'm not sure. The fact that it, it can be over or under, probably that's better than always being wrong in the same direction, but it means you, you have to worry about two kinds of errors, and it's not, it, which kind of error is better or worse depends on your domain. Um, you could be, you know, if, if you underestimate the probability of disaster, you will, likely suffer a disaster that you're unprepared for, but if you overestimate it, then you're probably over budgeting preparation that should be spent on something else. So it's bad either way. 
Okay, so that's all we have. That's all the time we have. So I saw that there's several other people with questions. Please post them in the chat, and Alan, I think you can get to them. We do have a started question of, uh, is there an example that you left out? So I really hope we get to hear that um, on, on Slack. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, there. on Slack. And actually, it's in the slides. So, oh, okay, um, great. And one more time, the URL for the slides is there, and so you can get to all the links from there. Thank, thank you all very much. Can you link it?